I'm a hunter. I like to hunt wild boar specifically. Though I've been deer hunting and been known to get a turkey for Thanksgiving, I like to hunt boar. For those of you who don't know, boar is a big problem in the United States. A sow can have two litters a year and it's not uncommon for a litter to consist of 10 or more pigs. Given that pigs eat anything and everything, it's not hard to see why the Department of Fish and Wildlife makes it legal to hunt them with almost no restrictions. In my state, it's illegal to hunt most large mammals with night or thermal vision scopes, with the exception of boar and coyote. I've been saving for a year, mostly fun money. It's hard to explain to your wife that a scope that costs literally twice as much as the rifle you're mounting it to is worth it, but I did it. I took it to the range and sighted it in. There was an area that was peppered with boar activity that I knew would be perfect for a night hunt. It was easily accessible with my truck with easy to find spots that I could set up in that overlooked a large easy to navigate clearing. The night started uneventful, mostly me just tinkering with my new toy, cycling through the settings. I was a little impatient. I spotted multiple deers, but they were out of season. And like I mentioned earlier, my current setup wasn't legal for deer. I moved to another spot that I'd seen days earlier. Probably wasn't much better than my first, but it gave me something to do and a new angle to look around with my new scope. After about an hour or so of glassing the area, it dawned to me, the spot doesn't have much animal activity at all. No rabbits or owls. The deer that I had seen were 100 yards away from where I was. Why was this pocket of land so dead at night, but lively in the day? I set up around 10 p.m. and it was around 2 a.m. when I started to think about packing up, maybe setting up a target before I left and taking some practice shots. I heard the crunch come from the direction I came from before. I panned the scope over and I saw the silhouette of a small bear pushing through the bushes. It's important to note that my scope isn't exactly night vision. It's a thermoscope, kind of like black and white version of what you see in the Predator movies. I adjusted my range and zoomed in a little. I remember jolting a little when I saw that it wasn't really a bear, it was a man. Because he was so low and hunched over, I thought I was looking at a young bear. Is that the game warden? It couldn't be. I would have seen the headlights coming from the road where I was perched. And where could he have walked from? I was 30 miles away from anything and on public land. I was about to call out when I adjusted my sight and noticed he was naked. No shoes, pants or anything. I remember being disturbed by his movements like a squirrel or something. Twitchy and grabbing at the foliage sniffing around and palming the tree. Was that my tree? The one that I had been leaning against earlier? The thought terrified me. Could he smell me? Then he did something that I still have nightmares about today. He squatted and placed his hands in the dirt between his feet and stared straight up like a dog mid-howl. And I heard it. A voice coming from that direction. A very compelling female voice. Help, Help. I'm, I'm lost. lost. There was a long pause, but neither of us moved a muscle. The center of my sight was trained in the dirt in front of his feet. I couldn't bring myself to aim directly at another person. It went against everything I'd been taught about firearms. Were they lost? Was this some guy that had gone crazy out here? Why was his voice so feminine? Help, Help. Please. please, I can't, I can't walk. walk. The voice called out. That's when I called bullshit. Not only could he walk, when I first saw him, he was traversing the land at ease for a naked person. So good that I mistook him for a bear. That's a fucking trap. This guy is trying to lure me to him with a damsel in distress routine. Luckily, the lack of activity before had caused me to pack up most of my gear. I think I may have left behind a hat and a sitting pad, but I didn't give a shit in that moment. I took my eyes off of him for a moment to get my pack on. I buckled my chest strap and scrambled for my rifle. To my horror, he was in the same position, but his face was staring in my direction, and I swear I saw a smile. The thermal scope has an effect that makes the animal's eyes appear white. How in the hell did he hear me get up and put my gear on? 
He must have easily been 150 yards away. Fuck off! I screamed in that direction. He stood upright and it hit me how tall and skinny he was. He was easily 6 feet and very lean. He took a couple of strides in my direction and I instinctively sent a round sailing above his head in the tree line. He was freaky as hell, but he hadn't really threatened me. I was unwilling and unready to shoot someone. He stopped dead in his tracks and hunched down on all fours. The next one will fuck you up. Go away. He stayed on all fours and at this time, I had my sights trained on the center of him. His eyes were just above the grass, like a large cat or something. I was trying to stop my trembling and knew that my voice cracked a little on my last warning. I was terrified. The standoff probably only lasted a minute or two, maybe less, but it felt like forever. In an instant, he bolted to the left towards the tree line, opposite the road. So much for not being able to walk. I could barely keep him in my scope, he was moving that fast. He disappeared into the brush and I sent another bullet sailing high in his direction. I racked up another round and tried to pocket that mag and swap it out for a fresh one but I dropped it and didn't bother looking for it. I wasn't far from my truck and I wanted to get out of there. I could hear him in the distance yelling in his weird sound that could have been a laugh or a cry. I scrambled up the trail and arrived at my truck breathless. I tossed my gear in the cab and kept my rifle on the passenger seat as I sped off. For the longest time, I told the story from the perspective of having spotted some deranged crackhead living off the land like some kind of caveman. I reported to Fish and Game, but all they did was scold me for hunting alone at night. Never received an update. It wasn't until I told the story at a camping trip that my nephew told me about Wendigos, Rakes, and Skinwalkers. My story scared the piss out of him because the spot that we were camping was technically the same forest I had seen that bastard, just 50 miles east of it. He was so spooked, his mom, my cousin, had to take him home. She was really pissed. I've gone down the rabbit hole on these scary stories. I'm not saying what I saw was definitely a wendigo or a skinwalker. I'm saying that if such things do exist, I may have dodged quite a bullet that night. Or maybe it was just a tweaker, being Donnie Thornberry in the middle of the night. Either way, I thought I'd share. This took place two years ago. I just recently turned 19. I was a college freshman going to school in a small town in South Louisiana. My parents were the pull yourself up by your bootstraps type. Having done their best to instill the strong work ethic in me growing up, they'd expect me to pay for my own tuition, with no help from them whatsoever. Not gonna lie, I was a little annoyed at first. I didn't mind paying my own way, but I was concerned about the impact working all those hours would have on my social life, as I wanted the full college experience. I started working part-time as a waiter at a local seafood restaurant. Shifts were limited and tips were scarce, my dad recommended supplementing my income through yard work, saying I could use his riding lawnmower and leaf blower. Anyway, I started making pretty good money mowing lawns, managing to snag a few clients through word of mouth. My best friend Blaze was working as a cashier at a local corner store while he attended a nearby college. He happily recommended my lawn care service to any customer or coworkers. I was ecstatic. I was not only making enough money to pay for school, but I even had a little left over to get my beat up old truck some much needed repairs. He told me about a guy he worked with at the store, a slightly older guy, mid 20s I believe. His name was Alex. He was quiet, didn't smile much, a bit of a loner type. It didn't matter to me, I was only looking to make cash. He said he needed someone to mow his front and backyard as he didn't really have the time. He didn't really elaborate to what he did outside of working at the grocery store, but I guessed it wasn't much. So my friend gave me Alex's number. No big deal, right? After all, I was going to give it out to anyone who might have been even the least bit interested in my services. Turns out that was the start of what would be a year-long nightmare. 
Alex texted me on Saturday morning, a day after my friend and I had talked. It was pretty cordial and simple, nothing more than, Hey man, what's up? Your friend told me that you cut grass. I gave him an affirmative, and then asked if he would like me to come over, and how frequently, given how often it rained here in South Louisiana. He simply told me to come over later that day, and that he wasn't sure if he could afford me on a weekly basis. Whatever I thought. Maybe we could work out some kind of arrangement. I immediately hopped out of bed, got dressed, and drove to where he lived, which was located on the far side of town, across the bayou. His house wasn't located in the nicest of neighborhoods. Many of the houses were run down, seemingly in a state of disrepair. The yards were thick with grass, knee-high length if I remember correctly. I didn't think any of those people could afford to pay me even a quarter of what I charged at the time which wasn't much, at around $45. I finally made my way to Alex's place, which didn't look all bad compared to the other houses. Horizontal siding painted a soft pastel blue, sat atop dark gray bricks, with a cracked bay window in the front. I parked my truck on the side of the street and shot him a text stating that I had arrived. He came out of his house in a wrinkled t-shirt and pajama pants, looking as if he just woke up, Hey, I said, smiling as I usually do. Rough night? I asked jokingly. He didn't respond, just blinked, and ran his hand through his dark blonde hair for what felt like an eternity, but realistically could have been less than a minute. We both stood in complete silence. His dark green eyes bore into me. I invert my gaze, catching sight of a fallen branch that had broken off a large oak tree in his front yard. We had just got hit by a hurricane a few days earlier. So how'd you guys weather the storm? I asked, my eyes affixed to the broken branches and scattered leaves. He simply shrugged and said, Okay. It occurred to me that I might have been speaking to the wrong person. You're Alex, right? You work with my friend at Village Market? He nodded. What the fuck was with this guy? I thought. I just kept smiling, as I always did when I would get especially nervous. I told him that I have a lot of clients to get to that day and that I better get started as soon as possible. He just nodded and pointed to the back gate on the side of the house. He started walking and I followed. It was a sizable backyard, children's toys scattered almost everywhere. There was a cluttered tool shed next to the fence far off to the left. I did my best to hide my disgust as I nearly stepped in some dog shit. It was weird. The backyard was like a minefield of dog shit, yet no dog to be found. I brushed the thought away and just went to work. Alex didn't bother me or really interact with me at all that day. He seemed really friendly via text. I just chalked it up to him being really socially awkward, like my friend said. He paid me once I finished mowing his lawn and then I went on my way. Later that night, he texted me again. He apologized for how he acted, saying that he was just tired from the night before and that he wasn't sleeping well and under a lot of stress. I replied that I understand completely and asked him if he needed me next week. He ignored my question and asked if I could suggest anything from Pelicans on the Bayou, the restaurant where I'd been working. At first I was taken aback by the question. I wasn't sure how he knew I worked there, but then it occurred to me that my friend must have told him. I recommended the battered chicken wings and he thanked me. We started texting back and forth the next few days. He asked me questions about my life, nothing too personal. He'd make inappropriate jokes, nothing I couldn't handle though. He seemed like a pretty cool guy when we talked via text. Strangely, most of our conversations happened late at night or early in the morning hours on weekends. Again, I didn't mind because he was a paying customer and I was a friendly guy. About a month had passed when my friend Blaze had sent me a screenshot of a text he received from Alex. It was supposedly a text sent by me, saying all sorts of horrible things to Alex, like, He's a fucking loser who'd never get laid and needed to get a real job. Shit like that. I couldn't believe what I was reading. In the fake text, he even threw some homophobic slurs, which offended me greatly since I had a gay uncle that I was really close to. I decided it would be best just to ignore him. This guy was clearly unwell, trying to start shit with someone he barely knew he texted me a few days later, acting as if he'd done nothing wrong. 
The text kept coming. He chatted with me like we were longtime friends. My patience grew thin. I finally snapped and messaged him back. Dude, I know what you did. If you know what's best for you, you'll leave me alone. He feigned ignorance at first and then proceeded to apologize profusely. I didn't care at that point. I didn't know that guy at all. He was nothing to me. I was busy with my school and work and I had absolutely no time for any of his drama. I blocked his number. I thought I was over, but I couldn't have been more wrong. A few weeks later, I received another text, this time from a completely different number. It was Alex, again with more apologies. I blocked the number. I figured that he would finally take the hint and leave me alone. He didn't. He ended up adding me on Snapchat using the fake profile. I accepted his request. The name looked familiar, so I thought nothing of it. He asked me if I still worked at Pelicans. I told him that I didn't as they kept cutting my hours. He then asked if I was still cutting grass. I told him that I was, but for only close friends and family members, as I had a bad experience with a former client. He then proceeds to ask me for details. By then, I figured out it was Alex. I told him to leave me alone and that if he didn't, I was going to the police. I then received a text from my girlfriend at the time, asking me if I knew a guy named Troy. He supposedly saw me cheating with another girl at some party. I told her everything that was going on. She wasn't sure if she believed me, as I did have a history of playing the field. I told her that I was completely faithful to her, and this guy was fucking nuts. She told me that I better start collecting evidence, taking screenshots of his texts he sent, and that's exactly what I started doing. Most of the texts were pretty benign, just more of him asking me for forgiveness. Then late, one Saturday night, he sent me another text. This time, it was a picture of my house. I was drinking with a few buddies of mine at the time, Blaze included. I immediately showed them the text. He suggested that we call the cops. Some of my more aggressive friends suggested we go outside and beat his ass. I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't really want to get the cops involved but I certainly didn't want to go outside, not knowing if he had a weapon of some kind. I told everyone to just stay in the house and not to do anything. I peeked through the blinds and saw nothing. He couldn't have been there for long. He must have left as soon as he had taken the picture. I didn't hear from him for a few weeks. Blaze, along with the other two cashiers, asked to not work the same shift with Alex. I was hoping maybe it was finally over. Maybe he moved on to someone else. Then on a cold, early October evening, I came home from class to find my mother shaken. I'd never seen her like that before. I asked her what was wrong. She was speechless, trembling almost. She showed me what she found laying on her front porch. It was a large manila envelope with Instagram pictures of me with my eyes scratched out and red X's drawn on my face. A chill went down my spine. I don't think I've ever been this afraid in my life like I had never known real fear up until that point. My mom insisted that we go to the police. I agreed. She ended up talking to a close family friend who knew the sheriff. A couple of officers came to the house, took our statements, told us that if Alex ever came by again, to call them immediately. I didn't hear from Alex again after that. He was fired from the grocery store. The owner caught him stealing from the register. Life went on. Months went by, and I felt like I could finally breathe again. Then one day, when I was running errands for my mom, I saw Alex standing on the side of the road. He was holding up a clipboard sign, asking for money. He locked eyes with me. They were cold and emotionless. I could feel that familiar shiver creeping up my spine. It was as if everything had came to a complete standstill. After I regained my senses, I sped off, hoping that that would be the last I ever see of him. I worked at a gas station when I was 18, and I posted the other day about a coworker who I found out was a Nazi. I have a ton of stories from my short time working there, so I wanted to share another one. This story concerns a friend of mine whose permission I have to post. I lived in a country area with a ton of backwoods type. A lot of them are great people, just the old fashioned working type, but a lot of them are shady or have backwards ideologies. 
and everyone needs to get gas, so this led to a lot of creepy encounters. There was a notorious old man, Charles, who was known to be a perv and always extremely rude to any male employee, but overly friendly to female employees. If I was working, Charles would come in with an attitude just to complain and be a dick for no reason. He did not like me. Well, my friend Kayla from high school started working there and she was 18 as well. She was the youngest female employee. Charles became fixated on her, even though he could be her grandpa. Charles would try to wait off to the side anytime Kayla was working so that he could just talk to her. Would try to buy her things, giving her gross compliments about shit like the way her jeans fit. The store managers, two women, were on her side, but we tried to tell the main manager and he told her just to ignore him. Well, one night, Kayla and I were working the 2 to 10 shift together. It was around 9 p.m. I saw Charles coming, so I told Kayla to go in the back. He came in and demanded to talk to her, yelling at me, making gross comments about how he would change her life and how he knew she was there. He even threatened me. He had a large hunting knife clipped to his belt. The main manager told us not to call the cops on him, but I decided fuck it. And I told Charles that I'm calling the cops. He left, but was found wandering the streets nearby. The cops took us seriously, and the store decided to ban him permanently. He ended up being charged with disturbing the peace, and thankfully, we never saw him again. The main manager ended up apologizing for not taking us seriously, and said that we did the right things by calling the cops. So, at least there was that. We looked up his name and found out that he was a registered sex offender, which makes the story even worse. Just for a fun little extra fact, he has like 20 mug shots that were found easily online and was laughing in all of them. So I don't think he cares about the repercussions of his actions. For context, I live pretty far in the middle of nowhere, and last night, my brother visited me. We had planned to drink, but eventually ended up taking a late night stroll in the woods, cause why not? We had taken late night walks plenty of times, just with the difference that we usually hang out at his new place, downtown, where there's no such thing as the large wooded areas. So yeah, we were pretty excited to go into the forest for a change. As we were making our way up the hill, lost in deep conversation, my brother abruptly stops in his tracks. Before he could explain himself, I knew exactly what he had heard. I heard it as well the second time. There was a very quiet, yet very distinctive, wet horse coughing, and it sounded like it wasn't too far away, maybe about a couple feet. Remember, it was past 1am and like I said, this was the middle of nowhere. It is extremely rare to run across another person in these woods, even at daytime. So without reconsidering once, we were like fuck this and turned around to get the fuck out of there. The weird shit didn't stop there. As we were finally back on the narrow dirt road leading home, we saw a bright light yards behind us. At first we thought it was someone riding their bike with some kind of single light attached to it. When we realized that the light didn't move at all, in fact it only seemed to get brighter to the point where it looked more like an actual truck headlight than your average flashlight. We eventually pointed our own flashlights back at it, and after a few seconds, the strange light went out, just as suddenly as it had came on. I'm not sure if we heard anything after that, but at that point, all we wanted to do was get inside and away from whoever was out there with us. We had also heard some demonic screeching coming from somewhere in the woods at the same time, but I'm sure it was just a deer trying to attract a mate. Great fucking timing. Well anyway, that's it for today. Thought I'd share a little creepy encounter on here. I've had my fair share of wild experiences. I can share more if people are interested. But this story in particular is about a killer in the making. I dated my sophomore year of high school. I didn't date him by choice. In fact, I already had a boyfriend who I loved very much. I had started dating him in May. He graduated and I continued high school in the next year. That's when this creep took an interest in me. I was never pretty or popular, but this year I had decided to put in some effort. I dressed nice, wore makeup, and used contacts instead of wearing my glasses. 
that's when a fairly popular boy noticed me. He started chatting with me and eventually asked me to homecoming. I was flattered, but of course I said no, since I was very happy with my boyfriend. Well, he didn't take too kindly to being rejected. He proceeded to pull out a knife, one of the three he carried with him daily, and told me that I had to break up with my boyfriend and go out with him instead, or he'd kill my boyfriend, my family, and eventually me. I was terrified, so I did what he said. I broke up with my boyfriend on the phone, and of course, I couldn't tell him why. He got upset and hung up the phone. Now that I was single, the creep got happier. He stopped threatening me and treating me like a girlfriend. He was pretty nice to me, but I knew if I ever tried to leave him or anything, he would hurt me. If I did something he didn't like, he would hurt me. I became afraid to go to school. I had to do my makeup right. I couldn't wear my glasses. I had to dress girly and pretty. We went to homecoming in matching colors, and it was hard to tell from the outside how fucked up things were. I thought maybe I could do this and it would be okay, until I got a strange text. A number I didn't know texted me and told me to tell my boyfriend, the creep, that if he didn't pay extra for the knife he was trying to buy, he'd kill me with it. That was it. I knew I had to get out. I ran to a teacher I trusted and she helped me break up with him in a crowded hallway. He cursed, punched the locker so hard he dented it, then stormed off. I thought it was over, but it was far from it. He started to post threats on social media. I went to the principal about it as I started to fear for my life. Since they weren't very specific, she said that there wasn't anything she could do. So I went on in fear for weeks until he posted a very specific death threat. There was no argument that he meant it for me. I went back to the principal and the police got involved. Two men were assigned to escort me to classes and protect me while I was at school as they figured out what to do with the creep. It was several weeks before they took action. His punishment? A 40 day suspension. That's it. But at least for those 40 days I could breathe. Now it was over. Except, a few days after his suspension I was in the bathroom by the cafeteria. I was the only one in there until another girl walked in. She stood next to me and told me that I shouldn't have said anything, that I was lucky for him to pick me. She started getting angry and calling me a bitch. Turned out, she practically worshipped this guy and was jealous of me. Suddenly, she pulled out a knife of her own and lunged at me. I managed to dodge her attack, but she managed to stab me one time in the shoulder. I freaked out and I bolted away, back to my friends, clutching my bleeding shoulder. They tried to ask what happened, but I couldn't stop crying long enough to tell them. She moved to the other side of the country before I could take action against her. With that, it was really over. The creep moved too, so he could have a fresh start I guess, and I went on with my life. This happened almost three years ago now, but I still have nightmares. I'm afraid someday he's going to come back to find me and finish what he started. When I hear someone say his name, even if they aren't talking about him, I freak. If I see something that reminds me of him, even a little, I run. It seriously fucked me up. I don't know how to stop being scared. At least I made it out alive. Welcome to Sinful's Horror Stories. Tonight's video features truly horrifying stalker stories. Story number one. Teresa Saldana and Richard Jackson. In the late 1970s and 80s, movie starlet Brooklyn native, 27-year-old Teresa Saldana captivated and gained the obsession of Scottish drifter, 47-year-old Arthur Richard Jackson. So much so that he moved to the United States to be closer to her in 1982. 
It was his fantasy, his dream, and his plan to not only find her, but also kill her, and to die himself by execution so they could be eternally together in the afterlife. Once in the United States, Jackson hired a private investigator to obtain whatever info he could on Saldana. He was able to gain access to her mother's private telephone number and called impersonating a representative for Martin Scorsese. Jackson claimed he needed to reach Teresa to discuss a possible film role. Saldana's mother provided him with her residential address and there he waited outside for the West Hollywood actress. As she exited her home in broad daylight, he attacked her, stabbing her ten times with a hunting knife in the torso, inches within her life. It is said that he did so with such fury, such power that the knife he used became bent. A delivery man ran out of an apartment building past several onlookers, rushed to the actress' side and subdued Jackson, saving her life. Jackson was convicted of attempted murder and given a 12-year sentence. While in prison, he continued to make threats against Saldana and began to also direct them at the man who saved her. Sending her letter after letter, the actress lived in fear for her life. He would write that if it wasn't him, he had friends that could kill her, and that upon his release he promised he would find her and finished what he started. She suffered from anxiety and insomnia, and was even hospitalized for the trauma she endured and the ongoing harassment. Jackson was later extradited to the UK for an unrelated crime, and later died there in 2004 at the age of 68. Saldana later played herself in a movie, Victims for Victims, the Teresa Saldana story, in 1984 telling her story and wrote a book, Beyond Survival, detailing the events and her struggles after her attack in 1987. She passed away at the age of 61 in June of 2016, but lived after her attack dedicating herself to fight for privacy and anti-stalking laws and advocating for victims who shared stories similar to hers. She was the founder of the Victims for Victims organization, which fought for the establishment of anti-stalking laws and advocated for victims' rights. She lobbied for the 1990 anti-stalking law and later went on to support the Drivers' Privacy Protection Act. Story number two. Rebecca Schaefer and Robert John Brado. A 19-year-old crazed fan was actually inspired by the actions of Arthur Richard Jackson when he became obsessed with 21-year-old actress Rebecca Schaefer. He hired a private investigator to obtain information on the actress, like Jackson did with Saldana, before committing murder. The Tucson, Arizona resident had an elaborate shrine of the actress in his home and wrote her numerous letters. He traveled to Los Angeles in 1987 and made multiple attempts to visit her on the set of her sitcom, My Sister Sam. He was turned away more than once by security while trying to gain access to Rebecca. In 1989, after watching a movie in which Rebecca Schaefer was involved in a sex scene, he became angered, enraged, jealous, and disappointed. He decided that she needed to be punished and called her another Hollywood whore. He traveled to Los Angeles and upon hiring a private investigator, obtained her address. It was as simple and as easy as a mere $250 to a PI. He buzzed Rebecca's apartment. She answered, and he told her how he was her biggest fan and even showed her an autograph of hers that he had. She politely asked him to leave and not come back to her private home again. Shortly after, he returned, buzzed her door again, and this time when she answered, he pulled out a gun from a brown paper bag and shot her to death in the chest. He was later arrested and confessed to the murder, receiving life in prison without the possibility of parole. The actress's rising career and life had been cut short, thanks to another man being able and willing to pay for information that should have never been accessible to him or anyone else. This case led to the Driver's Privacy Protection Act, which actress Teresa Saldana also lobbied for. 
since both private investigators had gotten a hold of their addresses through the DMV. It was made illegal for anyone to obtain private information on an individual through the DMV. Story number three, Laura Black and Richard Farley. This case of stalking ended in mass murder. Richard Farley, age 35, an electrical engineer for Electromagnetic System Labs Incorporated in Sunnyvale, California, became instantly obsessed with 22-year-old Laura Black when she was hired in April 1984. According to him, it was love at first sight. He would repeatedly ask her out despite her rejections and would continually buy her gifts and write her love letters. He told her he would continue to ask her out until she accepted or until the day he died. The letters, the gifts, and the advances continued. He also adopted a habit of following her around in his car and showing up at her home. She was forced to move several times because of his ongoing stalking and harassment. He went as far as going through her personnel files under false pretenses and befriending the custodial staff to make copies of her keys for her desk and files at work. Over these four years, she had received 200 letters from Farley. The stalking and the showing up at places she frequented reached an unsettling point. She went to Human Resources to file a complaint against Farley. He was ordered to not only stay away from Laura, but to also attend counseling sessions. The disturbing obsession and stalking did not stop, and he continued terrorizing Laura Black with increasing, threatening behavior. He was fired from ESL by summer of 1986, but his stalking and obsession continued. In February of 1988, Laura filed a temporary restraining order against Farley. The day before the hearing was scheduled, Farley arrived at ESL armed with a shotgun after purchasing several different guns and a few thousand rounds of ammunition. He shot his first victim in the parking lot and entered the building shooting his way in. He shot several people, killing seven and injuring others before arriving at Laura's office. After closing the door on him, he fired through, shooting her in the shoulder and collapsing one of her lungs. During a five-hour standoff he had with police, victims hid from Farley, Laura regained consciousness and was able to prevent the bleeding and survived after being rescued. Farley was found guilty on seven counts of first-degree murder and was sentenced to death. While in prison, he wrote to Laura one final time. He currently sits on death row in San Quentin. Story number four. Lori Show and Lisa Michelle Lambert. Typically, when we think about the word stalking, what comes to mind is a deranged man obsessed with a woman, intimidating her and terrorizing her life. In 1991, Lisa Michelle Lambert shocked us with her fatal jealousy, an obsessive stalking of her high school classmate, 16-year-old Lori Show, and forever made us change the way we think about stalking. Show and Lambert were friends for a brief period of time until Lambert grew unreasonably jealous of Show for thinking that she was after her on-again, off-again boyfriend, Lawrence Yunkin. Lori briefly dated Yunkin over the summer he and Lambert were not together, and she ended it after being sexually assaulted by him, and even confided in her mother about the attack. Yunkin and Lisa Michelle Lambert, who became pregnant with his child, got back together shortly after. Sho was interested in Yunkin and wanted nothing to do with him after the attack, but Lambert remained paranoid and jealous of Lori. She devoted herself to stalking and harassing her. She would show up at her work and verbally assault her, taunt her with unsettling phone calls, threaten her openly in public, sometimes even with death threats and physical violence. Lori's mother, Hazel, attempted to file charges against Lambert but this did nothing to stop her. On December 21st, 1991, Hazel received a phone call from the school counselor requesting she come to a meeting to discuss Lori. The phone call was a ruse to leave Lori vulnerable and alone and an impersonation by Lambert. Hazel returned home to discover her daughter agonizing as she bled out. 
she managed to tell her mother the name of her attacker by murmuring her final words. Michelle did it. She had been stabbed several times and her throat had been slashed. Michelle and accomplice Tabitha Buck were arrested the next day, and so was Yunkin, who took the girls to Lori's home that fateful day. He testified against the girls, stating that Buck slashed the victim's throat after both her and Michelle had stabbed her and collapsed one of her lungs. He received a lesser sentence for his testimony. Lambert and Buck both received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Story number five. Randy Barber and Gary Delapenta. Gary Delapenta became besotted with young woman Randy Barber in California in 1996. After meeting her through a friend, he was relentless in asking her out, sending her gifts and trying to win her over. Della Penta went as far as joining her church. The harassment reached a point so disturbing that Barber, who always rebuffed his advances, went to officials of their church to voice her concerns and express the threat she felt she was being exposed to. Della Penta was banned from congregation. For nearly three years, his attraction surpassed obsession as he spent his time stalking Barber and following her everywhere she went. He even took it upon himself to place ads in her home and various sex-related chat rooms. While impersonating her, he described a fetish for rape scenes and fantasies about being raped by strange men who entered her apartment. Della Penta included the woman's address in these ads. He created a fake email address using Barbara's name for contact with any men responding to the ad. He even provided instructions on how to break into her home and disarm her security system. As he still spent his time stalking Randy, he would give details on her schedule and social plans. Randy Barber received numerous unsettling and obscene phone calls regarding these ads, many with dirty solicitations. At least six men showed up to her private home during a five-month period, claiming to be there to fulfill her fantasy. She eventually resorted to placing notes on her door, saying the ads were false to turn men away. Della Penta went as far as putting a disclaimer on the ads he posted, stating that the notes were actually fake and all part of the fantasy. After handing Della Penta's name and suspicion to authorities, it wasn't long before his identity was confirmed through search warrants to internet companies. It was verified not only that all emails came from Della Penta's computer after going through his hard drive. He was arrested on charges of cyber stalking, a law that had just gone into effect a mere three weeks prior and sentenced to six years in prison. In 1999, he became the first person to be charged under this new statute. Story number six, Maria Marchis. A woman should always be heard always be seen, and always believed after experiencing any kind of sexual assault. Trampling and tainting over the stories of and disrespecting rape and sexual assault survivors, Maria Marchese falsely cried rape while embarking on a four-year terror campaign against psychiatrist Dr. Jan Falkowski in London in early 2000s. Marchese became infatuated with the doctor after meeting him in 2001 while he treated her then partner. She shortly after got a hold of his cell phone number and his home and work phone numbers. She began stalking him, calling him, writing him letters and sending him messages. She would confess her undying love for him and claim that they were born for each other and meant to be together. Convinced Deborah Pemberton, Falkowski's fiance, was trying to come between them and ruin their happiness, she began terrorizing her. She would prey on the couple through texts, emails, and phone calls and spy on them. Many included death threats to Pemberton and sometimes to Falkowski himself. Their wedding was even called off in 2003 after she threatened to burn Pemberton in her wedding dress and suggesting she die while writing in one message, a gunman has been paid. She broke into the doctor's home several times, one time attempting to cause an explosion by opening up all the gas taps. 
The harassment was so disturbing and so unsettling that Pemberton had a mental breakdown and fell into a deep depression, later ending his relationship with Falkowski. Marchese accused the doctor of rape in 2004 after stealing a condom from his trash can during one of her break-ins and spilling his semen in her panties. Falkowski lived under suspicion for over a year until evidence was obtained to clear his name five days before he was due to appear in court. Traces of his new girlfriend's DNA were found in the sample and helped show he had been framed by Marchese. Marchese had succeeded in breaking the engagement between Pemberton and Falkowski and damaging his name and reputation, hindering his career, but after 18 months his name was finally cleared. In January of 2007, Maria Marchese was sentenced to nine years in prison for the tear she unleashed on both Falkowski and Pemberton during all those years. Thank you guys for watching and listening. Please be sure to leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe for future content. Email your true scary stories to thesinfulsavant at gmail.com. I'll leave a link to my email in the description box below as well. Follow me on Instagram at sinfulshorror. I post daily true scary stories on there as well. I know you guys will love and enjoy that interaction as well. Till we meet again, stay sinful.